So, graph of y equals ux. Now, ux, don't let that fool you. That could be fx, for all you know. As in, they're just using a different letter. It doesn't affect the fact that it's a function and it's, it's a graph. Is that okay, you guys? Now, <clears throat> there's a rule with functions, okay? Just, just so we're very clear. One input cannot have two different outputs. Does that make sense to you guys? I'll explain what that means now. Imagine I had an S shape like this. Okay, imagine I drew an S shape. Everybody see the S shape there? Yeah? See the way it's sort of like a, an S? Now, do you see these three points here? This blue one, this blue one here, and this blue one here. Do you see the way they all have the same X value? So for argument's sake, they all have an X value of 2. Would that make sense? And for argument's sake, the Y values are 1, I don't know, 4, and 7. Do you see the way there's three points that have an X value of 2? Well, if that happens, it's not a function. Because a function, uh, every input, every X value can only have one Y value. It's known as the vertical line test. If you put a vertical line in any function, it's only allowed to hit the, hit the line once. So using this vertical line test, do you think this is a function, yes or no? How many times does it hit the line? So it's definitely a function. First of all, so it's just a function, okay? So I have a regular function, but it's still just a standard function, okay? Now, let's have a look at what it wants from you. U dash is the derivative of U. Use the graph to write down the value, which, right, perfect. First derivative is otherwise known as what? Who said slope? U, was it? So Raj has learned off that the slope is actually there. The slope is the first derivative. You cool with that? So, currently speaking, are you on your way up or your way down? That blue region is the place where your slope is positive. You cool with that? The red region is where your slope is negative. Is that okay with you guys? Where do you think roughly is the maximum point in the graph? Where do you think it reaches its top? Six or five and a half-ish, is it? I'd say five and a half or five and a half. That's when it reached its top and now it's slightly on the way down. Write down a value. It'll take any value we want. Write down any X value in the red region. So what's a good answer? Six, seven, eight, ten. Any of those numbers will do. Is that okay? So we'll just do X equals ten. On the diagram above, draw a tangent at the point 4, 2, and use the tangent that you draw to work out an estimate. Okay, that's a very difficult word, I have to say. I don't think there's anything wrong with the first part, though. Draw the tangent at 4, 2. What is a tangent again? A line that only hits the graph once. What point does it have to go through? It has to go through 4, 2. So 4, 2 is this one here, yeah? And I reckon if we keep it, yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? Doesn't look like it's going to hit again, does it? No. Is that okay with you guys? That's a tangent. Hits the point once, and just hopefully doesn't intersect the, 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 the graph more than once. Is that okay? Now, now here's, another, here's another question, all right? What does f dash mean? f dash what? It means the first derivative. Would you also agree it means the slope? Because the slope is the first derivative. What does f dash 4 mean? The first derivative when the x value is 4. Or the slope at x equals 4. Does that make sense? Now, what do you think u dash 4 means? It means exactly the same thing. The only difference is they're not using f, they're using u. So we're going to try and find the slope of this graph here. See the one I just drew? We're going to try and find a rough slope for it. So what do we reckon? Uh, trying to find, I'm trying to find two points on the graph. We know 4, 2 is on the graph, don't we? All right, I'll continue the line. Uh, I'll continue the line. Uh, that, that works nicely, doesn't it? What point is here? We'll just round it off to that point there. Is that right? 
So I've called that point zero one, sorry, sorry, one zero, and called the other points four two. So what do you reckon? You could use the slope formula, couldn't you? Everybody remember the slope formula? What's a quicker way of doing the slope formula? You do rise over, run. Positive slope, yeah? Two blocks up, and how many blocks across? Three blocks across, two blocks up. A slope of two over three. Slope is two over three. Is that clear, you guys? So the answer would be just two over three. You could have also done the uh, the slope formula using the two points. When we see this form of writing here, what's the mode we enter into our calculator? When you see a question like this, what's the mode you enter into your calculator? Science mode. If you, if you don't know how to do science mode, here's the best way of doing it. Keep dividing 1,200 until you end up until you end up in between 1 and 10. See the way you have to end up in between 1 and 10? So let's divide it once. What's that? 120, divide it again. 12, divide it again. How many times did we divide by 10? 3. So it's 1.2 by 10 to the power of 3. If you multiply 1.2 by 10 3 times, it will turn into 1,200. For those of you who don't remember, you can do it this way as well. 1,200. Press the equal sign. Go shift, set up, down. Oh, give me a sec. Number format, three. Science mode two. Select zero. Press equals again. 1.2, 10 to the power of three. If you change it back, Oh wait, I still do the other ones. Everybody see 0.27? Everybody see 0.27? Throw that into the calculator and it'll just kick it back out as 2.7 by 10 to the power of minus 1. So give me an example. What question you want me to do? Yeah. Oh, never be between one and fifteen. It's always between one and ten. It has to be. Yeah. Never ever ever. Okay. Next one. A falcon can dive at 120 miles per hour. One mile is 1.6 kilometers. Use this to work how long it will take a falcon to travel 100 meters. Okay, would everybody agree that, uh, sorry, start it from scratch. Would everybody agree that one hour, a falcon can do 120 miles? Everybody agreed with that? Turn that into kilometers, so multiply it by 1.6, and what you get? 192 kilometers. Turn 192 kilometers into meters. Huh? Right? We all good with that? Next question. One hour is how many minutes? And in 60 minutes, how many seconds are there? Another 60, isn't there? So what's 60 times 60? So would we all agree that in 3,600 seconds, a falcon can travel 192,000 kilometers. Oh, sorry, meters, meters. 192,000 meters. You okay with that? Provided it's diving pretty far into the water. Okay, now here's what we're going to do next. We want to find out how fast it can do 100 meters. Everybody okay with that? Now, can anybody tell me? How do you turn 192,000 into 100? What do you need to divide by to make that work? Hmm. Okay, scratch that. Scratch that. Have an idea. How do I figure out how long it takes me to travel one meter? Divide 3,600 by... 192,000 to figure out how long I travel in one meter. How long, how fast it takes me to go in one meter. Is that right? 
So we're going to get, it's going to be a really small number. And I am also might make sure I'm now signed some out. We'll see. Three over 160 kill you guys. Uh, I will in a sec, don't worry. I'll get that, don't worry. So it travels in three over 160 sec, uh, three, that, in that fraction of time, it travels one meter. How many meters am I after? I'm after 100, so I'm going to multiply this by 100 now. 15 over 8, otherwise known as 1.875 seconds. What's the answer in the back? And uh, if I round it off to the nearest decimal, which is one decimal place, I have 1.9 seconds. Yeah. So. We got it. Okay. What? Oh, to turn your calculator back, you do the exact same thing. You go shift, set up, you go number format, and you go back to normal, and you press normal one. Okay. All right, next question. That was a difficult part B there. All right, awesome. We have two graphs. How do we deal with that? Two functions. Function K is like a U-shaped one, and function M is like an N-shaped one, okay? Now, and it, it does it from zero to five, so it only draws from zero to five on the x-axis. Okay, let's keep looking downwards. Use the graphs to estimate the following. Two values of x for which m of mx equals zero. Which graph are you talking about when they're talking about mx? Which one is it? The the one that's the, the bottom one, isn't it? The, the n shape one, this one here, that one. Okay, what does mx mean? means the y value of the function. If the function was fx, fx would be the would be the y value. If the function is mx, mx is the y value. So it's asking you for when is the y value zero? What two points are the y is the y value equal to zero? One zero and four point five zero. So it's going to be one and four point five. That is when your y value of your graph equals zero. Find the range of values for which kx, the y value of k, is smaller than the y value of m. Does everyone know what that means? The y value of kx. So when is one graph above the other one? So let's find out. I'd say k is above, see this blue region here? Does everybody see the way that k is higher than m? It has a higher y value. And what about this point here? K is bigger than M, right? That's what it's asking for. Is that, oh, sorry. Less. So my fault. That's bigger. So where would smaller be then? That region in there, in between 2 and 3.5. That's your region where it's smaller. So we're actually after when K is smaller than M. So that's the yellow region because you can clearly see it's above it. So two, it starts at two and it ends at 3.5. All right, now how do you write that in maths language? First of all, you should write it in English if you're not good at inequalities. Just write, starts at x equals two, ends at x equals 3.5. At least the ex examiner knows what you're talking about. Or in between 2 and 3.5. To write this in maths language, it's going to be like this. <coughs> it doesn't say less than or equal. It says less than, doesn't it? So 2.5 less than x. Two, oh, sorry, sorry. 2 is smaller than x. And x has to be smaller than 3.5. Yeah, that was a tricky question. We all good? Okay. Question uh, eight now, yeah? Okay. Jessica's making up a solution of acids. She has two different bottles, each of the following concentration of acids, 12% and 5%. This means, for example, in 100 milliliters of bottle A, there's 12 milliliters of acid. Find out how many, uh, how many milliliters of acid are in 200 milliliters from bottle A. Okay. 200 milliliters, and how much of it is acid again? 
twelve percent of it. Twelve percent is is two is uh, acid. Multiply it out, and you'll get twenty four milliliters. Okay, because twelve percent of it is is acid. What did you want from me next? Jessica, Jessica mixes two hundred milliliters of bottle A with three hundred milliliters of, from bottle B. Okay, two hundred from bottle A. Agreed. Three hundred from bottle B. How much do we have in our mixture then? Would you agree it's five hundred? Everybody cool with that? How much uh, of it was acid in the first one? Not 24%, but 24 milliliters. 24 milliliters was acid, which is 12%. Next thing we got to do is got to figure out how much acid was in the next batch. So, no, no it's not 15%. It's, it's, yeah, I'll tell you. It's 5% of the 300, which is? 15 milliliters, you kill with that? So out of our 500 milliliters of mixture, how much of it is acid? acid? 39 milliliters is acid. So what do we do then? 39 divided by, multiply by, and what do we get there? 7.8%. Did anybody get those two parts out? They aren't too bad. All good? Okay. Explain why Jessica could not make a solution of 4% concentration of acid by mixing them together. Anybody have any of this? Yes. Bottle A is 12%. Can't get anything lower than that. And bottle B? 5%, was it? So the deal is you can't make it any stronger. So you, you can only ever obtain a, a mix between five and likewise if you're if you're making some sort of like a rum or party drink and you have like forty milliliters of I don't know sorry you have forty percent uh, vodka for argument's sake and you have uh, let's say peach snaps or something like that which is fifteen percent alcohol volume whatever mixture you're making will have somewhere in between 15 and 40% alcohol. You can't go bigger than 40, and you can't go lower than 15 when you're using that type of concoction, unless you actually add in tons of... Uh, if you're just mixing the alcohols, you can't go below 15 and 40. Do you get what I'm saying? You'd have to mix in something that has no alcohol whatsoever in it to go below. Do you get what I'm saying? Grand. All right, so it has to be in between 5 and 12. That's basically what we're saying. Okay. What's the next one? This next question, is it? So part four. All right, sorry, one sec. Okay. When she's making another mixture, Jessica makes a mistake of measuring. She makes a mistake of measuring. She wants to measure out 250 milliliters, but she measures out 260 instead. Work out the error. So how do you do that? Percentage error. It's your error over your true value. Multiply by. 100. What's your error? What's your what's the value where you're looking for? Multiply by. Okay, and what's that turn out to be? 4% error. Because that was handy, wasn't it? So please note that you can uh, please note that just because part two and three are hard does not mean part four is hard. And please try every question, okay? Now, we're on to question eight now, is it? There. Okay. C is the number of corners, E is the number of edges, and F is the number of faces. Okay. How many faces in a cube? Uh, roll a dice. How many faces? Six. All right. How many corners? One, two, three, four. Then there'd be four down the bottom as well. So <coughs> C is eight, right? And what's E? Edges. So edges will be uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then on the bottom, 9, 10, 11, 12 edges. So 8, take away 12, 
plus six. Is a takeaway 12 plus six too? <coughs> it is. Eight, 12, six. Okay, and it works, the formula does work. You all good? All right, what's the next part? Each of these faces of different solids in the shape of a triangle, each, each of the faces of, different, of a different solid is in the shape of a triangle of area five. It has 12 corners, 15 edges, and find the surface area. Okay, so here's the deal. Do you know these triangles? I can, make, I can make a couple of shapes out of triangles. Do you get what I'm saying? I can make a pyramid. You know, like a triangle pyramid. It's a triangle on the bottom, and then another triangle sort of... Uh... Does everybody see a triangle pyramid here? Do you, you see the way there's a, there's a triangle on the base? Does everybody see the way there's a triangle on the base and three triangles around the edges? It's known as a triangle uh, pyramid, okay? So there could be, it could be an object like a triangle pyramid. But the bottom line is, whatever they're using, I have to figure out how many triangles they have. So my job is to figure out how many faces they have and multiply each face by five. And that will tell me what the surface area is. If it's a triangle pyramid, there will be four faces, one on the bottom and three around the edge. So let's find out. Okay, so what's our C value? 12, our E value? Our F value is considerably larger than that. So what's that? Minus 18 plus F is 2. And our F value is 20. It's a very complicated shape. And there's 20 triangles involved. So you multiply 20 by 5 and what you get? Yeah. Anybody get that? 100 centimeters squared. You work out the F value, then multiply it by 5. You all good? All right. All right, lads, what about this one here? The surface of a third solid is made up of hexagons and pentagons. Our H and P are natural numbers, so there are numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. Use this equation to find the number of pentagons in the surface of this solid. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So here's what I'm thinking I'm going to do. I'm going to give them a common denominator. Does anybody know what common denominator I need to give everything? I'm going to give everything a common denominator of 6. I'm going to multiply the first 2 by 2, the next 2 by 3. Now, as I was telling my first years, see that minus there? That effectively turns it into a minus 3 I'm multiplying by. Okay. What about the next one after that then? 6 top and bottom. Alex? Another 6 top and bottom. And another six top and bottom as well. Everybody cool with that? Okay. So what do I get when I multiply the first one by two? Yeah. I would just find bother putting in the sixes. Multiply by minus three. Yeah. What? Plus six p. Okay. Any chance the H is cancelled? They do, don't they? Lucky. The H's disappear. Because there's 18 take away 18, which is nothing. How many P's are there then? 1P equals 12. Okay. It is. 10 take away 15 plus 1. 16 take away 15. I don't know what to tell you. Anybody else get P equals 12? All right, move on. What question is this now? Oh, that's it then, is it? All right, let's go, guys. Question nine. Graph represents a model that we use to predict the car's value. And the car, uh, the car depreciates a fixed percentage each year. So how much was the car when it was new, lads? How much was the car when it was brand new? How did how you know it was 3,000? Yeah. So yeah, it's zero zero years and it's thirty grand. Everybody cool with that? And then the first year it loses six thousand euros worth of its amounts. Does everybody see that? 
6,000 euros worth. And then after that, it's around, I don't know what that is, but after three years, it's 15,000, is it? Or just above 15,000? Okay. Now, they said it's a fixed percentage. So whatever percentage it loses in its first year, it loses in its second year. So what's the first question? I'll write down its initial value, no bother. 30G. What did we say the other one was 24? Okay, great. Now, lads, what's the next question after that then? Okay, show that it lost 24, show that it lost 20% of its value. How much money did it lose in its first year again? It lost 6,000 euro. It went from 30,000 down to 24 grand. How much was it worth initially? Put that in percentage mode. 20%, it loses 20% every year. Okay, based on this model, write a formula for the value of Brian's car after T years. Okay, I have an idea. If you, what happens every year? You lose 20%, but you retain how much? How much do you retain? 80%. So what you can do is 30,000 multiply by 0.8 to the power of t. Let's try it out. What happens if you put in t0? t equals zero, let's, let's find out. 3,000 multiply by 0.8 to the power of zero. What, what, what answer are we expecting? We're expecting 30,000. Do we get 30,000? Yes. What happens if we put in a one for t? What answer would we be expecting? 24 grand. Do we get 24 grand? Yeah. So that there is our formula. We're retaining 80% every time. Lads, one more question. If I was losing 30%, what would this formula look like? 0.7 instead of 0.8. If it was an investment and I was gaining 20% a year, what would it look like? Exactly. Good job. Well done. Right, happy with that. Now let's keep going. Answer otherwise, work out the value of Brian's car after four years. No bother. How do we do that? Just put in 0.8 to the power of 4. Uh, if you didn't know the formula, what could you do? Just keep taking away 20% for four years in there. Uh oh, and you'll get the same answer. Okay, so that's okay. 12,288. All right. Now, here's a new graph. The new graph, is this the same graph or a different graph? Same graph. All right, happy days. Same graph. And what does it want me to do with this graph? Want me to do a new graph with it? Oh, lovely. Okay, that's really nice. Okay, so wants me to do this one, is it? A different linear model assumes that the car reduces the price by a fixed amount each year. The value of the car will also reduce by 20% in its first year, according to this model. Draw a line on the diagram above, passing through the first two points on the graph. Okay, continue your line until it reaches the horizontal axis. Damn. Okay. Now, who knows what that means? Okay, here's what we're gonna do. It says 20%, yeah? So it assumes a fixed amount each year. So does that not mean, what's 20% of 30 grand? What's 20% of 30 grand? 6,000 a year, right? So no matter what, it's just gonna keep depreciating by six grand until what happens? Come zero. And how many years will that take? One year. Two year, three year, four years, five years. I can tell you right now, five zero is one of the points. But let's do it this way. Zero thirty, still zero thirty. What's the second point? One twenty four. But the only difference is we're going to do it in a straight line all the way down. This means you you, you lose six thousand euro a year. The slope is the same. You're always losing six thousand euro. All right. You ready, Sam? 
Man, loving life. Now, let's move on. Ava buys a new car that has a price of 19445 She pays 30% of this price as a, as a deposit. Lads, what's 30% of this? Somebody show me out the number. Anybody? Okay, I'll do it. Did I? What was the next question? Uh, five years. Five years will be when it's zero. Sorry, my bad. I didn't officially answer though. You're right. Okay, 30% of this one. 5, 8, 3, 3 points. Great. Okay, next thing. How many months? I did uh, three years worth of payments. So how many payments is that? If I do it monthly. It's 36 payments. Grab your 206 euro and 96 cents and multiply it by 36. What you get? And we have it. 74.92. Add the two of them together and take them away from the price of the car. So add the two of them together and take them away from the price of the car. So it's going to be 19,445. Oh, crap. 19,445. Take away 5833.5. Take away 7540.92. Oh. Did anybody get roughly uh, 6160.5A? Is how much money they have left? You did 36 payments of 206 quid and you put 30% deposit on it? Anywho. But you have to add them together and take it away from the full thing. Anywho, 